Well, next Tuesday, six days from today, three days into the new year, would be Polly Class's 42nd birthday. Generations of Americans know her name and her story. But if you live through that national nightmare, following the news coverage day by day, week by week, it may come as a shock to realize this all happened 29 years ago this fall when Polly was just 12 years old. She and two friends were having a slumber party at her mother's home in Petaluma, California, the night of October 1st, a man named Richard Allen Davis broke in and took a knife from the kitchen. He entered the girl's bedroom and made off with Polly, who was never seen alive again. Her body was found two months and three days later, 50 miles away, after Davis confessed to strangling her and told police where he buried her body. He had been arrested days before that on the basis of evidence left when his car got stuck in a ditch the night of the kidnapping. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. But because of a state moratorium on capital punishment, he sits on death row to this day. And Mark Klass, Polly's father, continues his mission to educate, advocate, protect, and reunite lost and endangered children in Polly's name. He joins us now live. Mark, thank you so much for being here tonight and for all the incredible work you have done. You've just come through your 30th Christmas without Polly and her birthday's coming up. So how do you get through these moments with strength and with hope for the future? Well, it, it's obviously gotten easier over the years. I mean, grief never ends. I think about Polly all the time, every day, um, but it's less and less every day and uh, I'd say it took a good 20 years to be able to even accept Christmas again. Um, it used to be that the time from the day Polly was kidnapped until after her birthday that I would have to be on Xanax. It was just so difficult for me to get through these things. But after a decade, I started to be able to appreciate life a bit again. And, and then another 10 years on, uh, my wife and I were able to start uh, celebrating the holidays again and doing it without guilt. So really, time is a, a good manager of grief. And, and um, if one is able to hold on one can get, and one can get to that point, one can turn one's life around and enjoy things. Well, I so appreciate you being so vulnerable and open. I think that helps so many people, you know, to, to show that there is light, there is hope um, for people going through similar situations. So thank you for doing that. Um, there are parallels to the Idaho murders and what happened to Polly, the home invasion, the lack of apparent motive, the weeks of not knowing. So how does reading or hearing about other heinous crimes impact you and your family? Well, I mean, it's terrible when these kinds of things happen, but nothing will ever affect us like our own crime affected us. And I can tell you that when Polly was kidnapped for 65 days, as you pointed out while we were searching for her, we held on to a modicum of hope. We felt that we would find her alive. And it was only after we found out the bitter truth that hope died. And once hope died, fear died with it. And anger swelled up. It was just absolutely unbelievable. It was it was the worst experience one could ever imagine. And just like the folks of the, the kids in Idaho, losing your child at any time is absolutely the worst stressor that can be inflicted upon a parent. Uh, it, it's so out of the ordinary. It's so out of the realm of what's supposed to happen that you're faced with some choices. You're faced with the choice of either uh, turning away from it, uh, losing yourself in alcohol or drugs, or finding a way to fight back, which I think is the most effective thing, and that's the path that, that we ultimately so Polly's case, it really was a mystery in that nobody knew what had happened to her until her killer was already in custody. So what would you say to the families of the Idaho students who now have endured 45 days without a suspect? Well, I think that they have to trust in law enforcement. As your previous guests were mentioning, law enforcement seems to be doing a, a wonderful job of doing this investigation. Now, although one would hope that they would be able to find the perpetrator sooner rather than later, but it just seems to me that they're going to have to, they're going to be able to solve this case because it seems like the, the, the 
group of suspects has got to be a small group. It's got to be people, be people that live there, people they knew, maybe registered sex offenders or other types of known criminals within the area. But uh, it just seems incomprehensible to me that this would be somebody that totally came out of nowhere and committed this heinous crime, which seems so personal against a couple of these young people that uh, they'll get there. It just might take some time. They just have to hope that they get there and, and, and depend upon each other and depend upon their own small community for support until they reach that, that goal. So you may be aware that the Moscow police have been criticized for what some people, including some of the victims' families, are saying are mistakes or omissions. Can you relate to those kinds of concerns, or what was your family going through during your daughter's investigation? It was absolutely terrible. And every day, every day that they didn't solve the crime seemed to me to be another day that they weren't doing their job, because their job was to solve that crime. So you get to a point where you second guess everything. Um, you believe police should be telling you everything when obviously they can't, nor should they, because it would it would it would change the investigation. It would compromise the investigation. So there's really it, it becomes adversarial, and we see this in this case too. It becomes adversarial between the families and law enforcement, and there's just so much anger and so much frustration that, that uh, it has to be directed somewhere, and until they get the perpetrator, it's probably going to be directed at law enforcement or even the public in general. You know, I remember one instance at the very beginning, and it, it helped inform our choice to go public with our grief. My wife and I were taking a walk just days after we found out about what had happened to Polly, and we were walking by a fence line, and there were people on the other side of the fence enjoying themselves. It was coming upon Christmas, and they were having a good time and we were incredulous we were just so angry that anybody could be enjoying themselves at a horrible time like this and you know you internalize these things and you you have to have an outlet and sometimes it's society in general sometimes it's the law enforcement but you you have to let your emotions out somewhere in some way well, you know, last night we had John Ramsey on, and of course his daughter, uh, John Bonet, was killed, and her murderer has not been found. It's been now 26 years. So do you believe it is possible to have peace without a resolution? I know that it's better to know the truth than to not know. Although once you realize the truth, once you learn the truth, then hope dies and everything changes in every way in your life. Everything changes. But as long as you don't know, at least for some period of time, you, you, you hold out that brief thread of hope that this thing will be resolved and it will be resolved in a way that will be pleasing to you, which obviously very rarely ever happens. It happened to J.C. Dugard. Um, it's happened to a few other kids over time, but the vast majority of people in our situation find out that their children have been murdered, and ultimately you're able to accept that and move on with your life. You hold on to hope by not knowing, but also you're stuck in time. You know, you're stuck in a place where, where you can't move forward because there's this big, huge mystery that's blocking your way. Well, Mark Class, we appreciate your bravery. We appreciate you speaking out and the amazing work you're doing in coming on tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. And again, Polly's legacy lives on through the Polly Class Foundation and class kids devoted simply to stopping crimes against children. You can find them at classkids.org. Well, next, French serial killer Charles Chabage, known as the serpent for his snake-like ability to avoid being caught by authorities, has admitted to murdering 12 women, but suspected of killing as many as 24 people. He was released from prison after serving 19 years, which is less than one year for each suspected life he took. So how did a serial killer end up on a flight home to France on Christmas Eve? A free man. We will break it all down when we come back.